Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the bridge. Uh, glad you could all make it. It's a beautiful day out there, isn't it? And uh, the Lord has made it, and He has. He, he's blessed us so much. Amen. Uh, but as you all know, it's been kind of a crazy week in the country. Uh, seems like the race problem we have isn't getting any better, is it? Seems to be getting worse. So we need to pray real intentionally now and just search our hearts because the problem's in here. The problem's in our hearts. And only God can fix that. And he can only do it one person at a time. Uh, so let's, let's right now, let's, uh, let's pray. Let's pray for our country. Pray for these families uh, that have lost their, their men, their fathers and, and brothers. And just, it's a horrible situation. And, and it, it's a very confusing situation. There's police brutality. There's, the list goes on. It's just very confusing. God knows what's going on. We don't. Media sure not helping us with it. So let's pray. Father God, we... We come to you today with joyful hearts because you are our God. And we know that you are in control of everything. But our hearts are heavy because of the violence that continues in our country. A country that is supposedly at peace. Yet, we still judge each other by skin color or by what we're wearing. Lord God, forgive us for the, for the racist thoughts that even we have had through this past week. We need healing. Lord God, we need healing deep down. And only you can give it. God, you are holy and, and righteous, the only righteous judge, and we are not. So please help us just to, to come to you, our community, our country. We need you now more than ever. We know that if we don't come to you, it's only going to get worse. Lord God, we ask these things in your, your son's precious name. Amen. But we do have that joy. Amen? Amen. And uh, we're going to celebrate that this morning because we worship a holy, holy God. So if you would now, please stand and uh, greet those close to you. Tell them you love them. Casting down their golden crowns 
verse you're about to see on the screen there is one you've probably heard many times. Uh, why don't we just read it and meditate on it for a second. Buried 
This is the time where we dismiss uh, the kids, uh, birth through fifth. And uh, as they go out, let's just take a good look at these guys. We have a wonderful generation ahead of us. I mean, just an absolute blessing to see these children. Uh, they're beautiful, and they, they just, they mean so much to us. And uh, it's good to know that they come here just willing to serve the Lord, and they're just excited to, uh, to get to know Jesus. So uh, let's uh, go to prayer and let's pray for, pray the, pray for them to uh, Sunday school. So. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for, uh, we thank you for these children as they are blessings to us. We thank you for the blessings that you give us through them as, they, uh, as you use them to shape our lives as well as uh, others just through their, their, their wonderful mentalities and just how beautiful they are in their heart. So Lord, we just pray that you uh, just be with the teachers and it just speak through them today as they uh, just teach the, the children more about Jesus and that they all have a, an increased joy today. So, Lord, we love you and we thank you so much for our wonderful children and our wonderful teachers back there. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, this next song is it's called Ancient Words. And, uh, when you hear ancient words, most people think the Bible, you know. I'm thinking of the Word of God as the Bible. But uh, I have to say that the Bible is not just a, an instruction book. It's a story. It's a, a beautiful story of our God, our Savior. And uh, he, he shows himself in us throughout this whole book. And uh, it's amazing. But uh, so I went back to some of the old texts and Psalms where it shows not just the God of the Father and the Spirit of the old time, but also the God in the flesh, which is Jesus, even back then. So in Psalm 33, 6, 
reads, By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, their starry hosts by the breath of his mouth. Psalm 107, 20 through 21. He sent out his word and healed them. He rescued them from the grave. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. That's Jesus. Psalm 119, 89. Your word, Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. That's all in Psalms. It's like they, they already knew of their coming Messiah, the Jesus, God in flesh. So in John 1, 1 through 5, he states it like this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made in Him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Praise Jesus. He's our light. This is what the ancient words are. The story of Jesus and what he's come to do for us. To save us and to love us and to be with us. So when we sing this song, let's sing it from our hearts. Let's meditate and just ask Jesus into our hearts and say, Lord, just show us. Show us you. Long preserved for our walk in this world, they resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart words of life. Words of hope give us strength, help us go in this world where'er we roam. Ancient words will guide us home. Ancient words. Ever true, changing me, changing you. We have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Holy words. Of our faith handed down to this age, come to us through sacrifice. Oh, heed the faithful words of Christ, ancient words. Change. 
changing you we have come with open hearts oh let the ancient words in ancient words ever true changing me changing you we have come with open hearts oh let the ancient words impart we have come Father, we ask that by your spirit, you would impart these ancient life-giving words of truth to us that are found in your son, Jesus. Thank you for your spirit in our midst today. May we continue to worship you in spirit and in truth by your grace. It's in your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. May be seated. Rich Mullins wrote a song called Creed, and one of the lines which basically the song is built on the Apostles' Creed, but one of these lines says, I did not make it, no, it is making me. It is the very truth of God, not the invention of any man. And I don't know where you've been this last week and what's been going through your mind, but as a number of things happen and there's a number of things that we see we have to look and and turn and go okay well where is the hope and the worship team just pointed us to where that is that God is still holy he's still on his throne he still reigns and he's still speaking to us these ancient words that are ever true we are Continuing on with the Sermon on the Mount, we're going to look at Matthew 5, 17 through 20 today. But before we do that, just as Matt shared that the Bible is a, a story of, of bringing us to God, I want to paint a picture that I believe might have happened before a man maybe went to do the journey to go and hear Jesus preach the Sermon on the Mount, perhaps he was reading parts of the law and parts of the prophets. And he was beginning to rethink Israel's history and recognize that though the God of Israel is faithful, the people of Israel are faithless. And that they have never been able to achieve obedience to the law. And perhaps one night, late at night, by candlelight, he reads, or perhaps he's even committed to memory, these words from Jeremiah 31, 31 through 33, that say this, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt my covenant that they broke. I wonder if the man maybe just stopped there for a moment. This covenant that God made that he freed freed his people from Israel and this man's looking and saying that my covenant that they, they broke. Though I was their husband, declares the Lord, and was a faithful one. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. And this is God in first person saying, I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, know the Lord 
for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. This was some almost 600 years before Jesus stood on the Sermon on the Mount, or should I say sat on the Sermon on the Mount and taught his disciples. So I want you to think that perhaps even the night before Jesus preaches the Sermon on the Mount, that a man of Israel that is heartbroken because his nation has been faithless to God is reading these words and on his way to the Sermon on the Mount perhaps looks and goes, could there be any chance that this and this prophecy right here, that this could come true, that God would still be faithful to a faithless people? So he gets to the Sermon on the Mount and he has heard Jesus start off by saying, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. And perhaps the man looks and goes, hey, this resonates with me. I am that. I look and I see if this is built, if our faith is built upon my performance, we have no hope. And this man, this holy man of God is saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. He's not saying it's built on performance. And then Jesus goes on and says, the, the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And this man looks and goes, the, the kingdom of heaven, when God will be our God and we will be his people and he will dwell in our midst? Yes, that's what I want. And goes on, blessed are those who mourn this man goes, yes, when I read Jeremiah 31 last night, I mourned, I cried, I wept because my people have broken the covenant. And then Jesus goes on, for they will be comforted. And as Jesus even speaks these words, the man's feeling this supernatural, overwhelming comfort and peace flood his heart and mind. And he goes on through the Beatitudes and then what we learned last week, that Jesus points to the disciples and says, you are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world. And we learned last week that in the Greek, it's not just you singular, it's you all plural. And the man's looking and going, wow, really? We, we get to have this role in the kingdom? And keep in mind, the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, have said, unless you're one of us, you don't get to really participate. But this man, perhaps more holy than the Pharisees, who's been up late reading Jeremiah 31, says, yes, I want to be the salt. I want to be this light. And says, let your light shine so that people may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Man looks and goes, yes, I'm sick and tired of people glorifying themselves. I want us to glorify the Father. And now Jesus hones in in this passage we're about to read on what those good works that will glorify the Father look like. That Jesus is building a foundation on what the whole rest of the Sermon on the Mount is going to be about. And he wants to clear up every single misunderstanding. And he wants to say, it's not about the external. It's about the internal. And when the internal is right, the external will take care of itself. But if you attempt to do the external without the internal being right, you will be at best a hypocrite. And at, well, we'll just at best, a hypocrite. If that's the best that we are as hypocrites, if we try to play this out, if we try to play walking with God, it's exhausting. You're living a lie. And the reality is you're not fooling yourself. You're not fooling other people. And you're definitely not fooling God. And Jesus loves us enough to say, I want to free you from that. I want to free you from the religious garbage that's external, but not an internal 
transformation. And I am here to produce the internal transformational change that your heart longs for. My heart longs for that. It's my prayer that yours does too. Let's read this. This is Jesus' words to us. Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would take these ancient words and use them to change us as a community of believers. That you would impart your truth by your spirit in us in a way that makes us be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And that we would understand today what true righteousness is. We pray this for your namesake, for your glory, and so that your son may be treasured in our hearts, in our church, in our community, and throughout the world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's so once a story of a girl that starts dating this guy and this girl has grown up in this small country church and he decides to start attending this small country church with the girl who he's dating and maybe not all the motivations on attending are correct, but uh, he's going. And something about the way that the Spirit moves in the midst of this small country church, grip him, and he begins to ask question after question after question. And the interesting thing is that the girl who grew up in the small country church is having a very, very difficult time answering the questions. And what's interesting is that at a certain point in the service, everyone in the church turns and faces this side of the sanctuary and recites the Apostles' Creed. And, you know, the Muslims, you know, turn and face Mecca when they pray, and this guy knows that, so he says, what is it about this side of the sanctuary that makes it somehow more holy that we all have to turn here and recite the Apostles' Creed? Why do we all, the whole church turns that direction? And she goes, I don't know. We've just always done it that way. Some of you may be able to identify with this idea of, well, we've just always done it that way. So she begins to ask. She asks her parents. Parents go, I don't know. We've just never questioned it. The Apostles' Creed is good. Who cares what direction we turn? Then she asks the grandparents. She asks great aunts and great uncles, and finally, a great aunt, 90 plus years old, says, oh honey, I remember that. Back when the church was first built, somebody painted the words to the Apostles' Creed on that wall. It since has been painted over, over and over and over again, but we all still just turn there and face that direction. Why do we do what we do? It is good to have people come into our midst and ask questions. And uh, well, I don't know, we've just always done it that way. Thank God that guy was persistent and continued to ask until he got an answer. It's some things that maybe 
convenient for a time, for a season, aren't always convenient or effective later. Except Jesus has come on the scene. And what has he done already? He has healed on the Sabbath. That is one great big no-no according to what the Pharisees have in, in the ways in which the Pharisees have interpreted the law. So word travels about Jesus and people are whispering, and this is also small towns and, and small town gossip travels pretty fast. And, and they're looking at Jesus and going, hey, you know that Jesus guy? I mean, he just doesn't, he doesn't follow the rules. He cheats the system. He's kind of acting like he's here just to throw out and abolish the law. What's the story? Why is he doing that? He's not following the rules. And Jesus comes to clear it up. And Jesus says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I've not come to abolish them. He repeats this twice. I did not come to abolish them. I did not come to abolish them. I have come to fulfill them. What's the difference? Someone who is unable to complete a task, but attempts to complete that task, will not accomplish it, even though they try. So I confess last week that I am not handy at all. I am unable to probably hammer a nail and straight. But there have been a handful of things that I have attempted to do around my house, even though I do not have the skill and competency and experience to accomplish it. I either say it's the thing that I'm trying to fix fault, okay? It's, it's, it's that thing. That thing's just not cooperating. It's, it's not me, it's that thing. Or I say, well, it just, it just can't be fixed. I guess we'll just go out and buy a new one. And I'm sometimes afraid to think of the number of things that probably weren't really totally broken. I just didn't have the ability to fix them. And I went and bought a new one because I didn't have the ability to fulfill it and do it. So the Pharisees and the scribes at that time are going to a law in order to interpret the law and they have no skill level and no competency and no capability to actually live this law out. So what do they do? You got two extremes. One extreme is, well, the law is broken and I'm just going to totally disregard it. And that's present in today's world and sadly, many Christians have bought into the lie of thinking, well, I'm saved and whatever I go and do, it doesn't really matter and I don't have to take all of the words of Jesus seriously because at the end of the day, I'm saved and I can pick and choose out of this word what I want to obey and what I don't want to obey. It's called licentious living and it makes very costly, very treasured grace cheap. And Paul addressed it when he said, shall I continue to go on sinning so that grace may prevail? And he says, by no means, which really in Greek is much stronger. It's more like hell no. So there is this sense in which some people have said, well, it doesn't really matter. And then there's this other extreme called legalism. And what you do with legalism is you rig the system in your favor. So these Pharisees and these scribes are going, well, I don't really have the full capability to carry out this law in its fullness, but we can tweak it here and there. We can relax it and we can make it a little bit easier to actually follow. So they looked and they found 240 laws that were uh, kind of thou shalts and thou shalt nots, and then another 300 something of, of other things. And they compiled these things together and said, 
this is what we are going to obey. And this is what everyone else should obey. But they slowly begin to miss the heart of the law. I've read that folks that have been blessed with lots of resources that they pass down to children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And maybe the person who's been blessed with the resources has a very single-minded vision and mission on what to do with those resources. But as they're passed down, greed and impure motives come in and the pureness of the mission and the vision gets lost over time. Well, between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament, there is a 400-year period of silence where God basically doesn't speak in the holy and errant word. And during that 400-year time frame, you got lots of Pharisees and lots of scribes and lots of teachers of the law that are saying, well, I wonder, I mean, religion still has to go on, so I wonder how we can fix it a little bit. And they focus on all of these external things that don't get to the heart of the matter. And Jesus is saying, I didn't come to abolish this law. These people who are saying that it was wrong for me to heal on the Sabbath don't understand the heart of the law. My role and my job is to fulfill the law. Because guess what, guys? Jesus Christ is the only one capable, competent, and experienced enough to fulfill the law. And one of the main purposes of the law throughout all the Old Testament was for human beings to look at this law and to understand how holy and righteous it was and go, oh boy, I'm in deep doo-doo. I have no chance and no hope. So the man that I'm imagining might be there listening to the Sermon on the Mount hears Jesus say, I didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And he connects a dot between this fulfillment of the law and Jeremiah chapter 31, where it's one of these situations where it says, now I, the Lord, will put my law on the hearts of the people. And I will be their God and they will be my people and they'll live in my midst. And this man who the night before perhaps read Jeremiah 31 is actually looking and going, yes, could it be that this man, Jesus, is the fulfillment of all my heart longs for? And he is. Then he says, truly I say to you, Jesus is building up to this point. The Beatitudes are mainly in third person. Salt and light are in second person where Jesus points to you and now Jesus says, now I have the floor. Now I say to you, the one who fulfills the law is now speaking to you. And he says, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. What, what's going on here? Jesus is speaking to those that say, oh, that part of the law doesn't apply to me anymore. And Jesus is going, no, it does. Every single iota, which was the smallest Greek alphabet, and the dot translated in, is the Hebrew, which I didn't do very well in Hebrew in school. I couldn't get over the idea of reading backwards. Um, but the, the, this, this little bitty just little dash, okay, that that doesn't actually even change the meaning, okay? And Jesus is saying that not even the little bitty dots are going to disappear until heaven and earth pass away. As long as this earth is revolving around the sun, that the law and the prophets matter. The problem is not with the law, The problem is with the people who interpret the law and miss the heart of what the law is about. The law in the Old Testament has always been by grace. 
and it's always been God initiating relationship with us. But after God initiates that relationship with us and calls us to himself, God says, what does the Lord require of you? Micah says, to do justly, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. So what is Jesus doing here? He is saying all of that and the heart motivations of that, those matter. And then he talks about whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom. Well, what does it mean to relax one of these laws? In some ways it's to say, oh, well, that isn't really that big of a deal. Except the Pharisees had a unique way of relaxing these laws. The things that were externally possible to apply and do, they would be extremely strict on. Let's give an example. We're going to get to it in a few weeks. It's talking about marriage and, and divorce. And, and it got to a point where certain scribes could somehow justify that a man could divorce his wife. By the way, wife couldn't divorce man. But the scribes didn't really worry about that because most of them were men. Um, if... You didn't like your meal. You're out. And that somehow it was a justifiable thing. And, and to, there's something that just doesn't really equate with the idea of act justly, love mercy, walk humbly with thy God. When a husband says, honey, you burned dinner. I want a divorce. Those things don't translate out very well or one that is walking on the Sabbath day and you have a certain allotment of steps that you can take on the Sabbath day. And this person miscalculated his journey on the Sabbath and has gotten to the final step and is stuck in the middle of an extremely hot day and just, what do I do? I guess I have to wait until sundown because I can't take another step without sinning. This ridiculous thing that's taking place. And it says, not only will these people be considered least in the kingdom if they relax these laws, but also if they teach others to do the same. That these Pharisees and scribes and, and, and today uh, pastors and teachers of the law and, and teachers of the law, that sounded really weird. Am I a teacher of the law? I hope not. Kind of, yes, I am, I guess. Anyway, it's a lot better to say, I, I preach the gospel. You know, we, even in our language semantically, as a culture, law has a bad word attached to it, doesn't it? It's like we hear law and we go, eh. We hear gospel and we go, oh, cool, good news of great joy for all people. I like that. What if the law is necessary in order for us to get to the gospel? which is good news of great joy for all people. And what if those who think they can bypass the law and get to the gospel end up missing some of the beauty and riches of the gospel because they didn't go through the law first? If Jesus said he did not come to abolish the law, then the law still has a purpose today. And it is supposed to lead us to our knees and then point us to Jesus. And in Jesus we go, here is the hero who fulfilled it all. But in relaxing some of these commandments and teaching others to do the same, and Jesus has stern words later in Matthew for the Pharisees. It's called the woes to the Pharisees. And one of the woes is woe to you who basically make religion and following God so difficult that no one could accomplish it. It would be better for you if a big weight was tied around your neck and you were thrown into the bottom of the sea than it will be for you on judgment day. And, and we have these things, and we all have them. You, you're, you're, you're wrong to think that you don't. There are certain pet peeves that we have, and then there are certain sacred cows that we have of things that we feel are really, really, really valuable to us that we emphasize. But if it's not a mountain, 
in God's eyes, if it's more like a molehill, then we may be missing the heart of the law. And then, verse 20, Jesus uh, makes this mission impossible for all of his hearers. He says, I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Today, we have a view of scribes and Pharisees that's kind of like, oh, those are the bad guys. Those are the guys that Jesus was always critical of and being hard on. That was not the view of the average Jew when Jesus walked the earth. When Jesus was walking the earth, the Pharisees would have had the respect and reverence that Mother Teresa does in our culture today. They would have been seen as these are the holy ones that really, really walk with God. And Jesus looks at them and says, if your righteousness doesn't exceed theirs, you have no hope of getting into heaven. How could Jesus say that? When you and I think that it is our job to earn salvation or earn God's favor based upon our performance, then our righteousness is our righteousness. And I don't know about you, but my righteousness, Stephen Helfrich's righteousness, is a mixed bag. And I'm lucky if I'm one out of three in doing things, the right things, in the right way, at the right time, for the right reason. And the Pharisees thought that all of these laws that they did obey, and they did, they observed all the appropriate fasting times. They gave tithes and offerings. They were sacrificial with their time and giving of their talents. But they missed the heart of mercy and compassion and justice. Why why did they miss those things? I think, because those are things that you and I are unable to produce. We can produce some level of good works, but then, and and you can almost make yourself crazy thinking about this. You do something nice for someone else, and then you say, why did I do that nice thing for that person? So they think I was a good person. Oh, oops, well then it just kind of like, back triggered to be self-serving and self-giving, you know, instead of, I did this good thing because I want God to be known and loved and treasured. So Jesus is saying, the righteousness that exceeds that of the Pharisees and the scribes is a righteousness that you and I cannot produce. It's a righteousness that must be given to you as a free gift of grace. And that's the new covenant. And the new covenant that this man that I imagine might have been reading Jeremiah 31 and is looking forward to the law being in the heart, that's what happens with rebirth. Someone said that the Pharisees didn't need God's righteousness because they were pretty pleased with their own righteousness. And I don't understand all of how you can be pretty pleased with your own righteousness, honestly. Until I begin to think, I did pretty well this week. Way to go, Stephen. I go, wait a second. I did pretty well this week. Way to go, God. Thank you, God, that you put the right things in my heart and in my mind to love my family, to love my church, to love my community. Thank you, Jesus. This is not of me. This is of you. But there was someone who did have to work to fulfill the law. And, and there's, there's a 
It can be a misconception here because Christians are called to work too and we're gonna talk about that in a second. But the one that for sure had to do the work to fulfill the law was the one that had the capability to fulfill it. And everywhere Jesus walked, what does it say about him? He did only what he saw his father doing. He was not worried about the opinions of people. He was worried about pleasing his heavenly father. And when he asked his heavenly father in the garden of Gethsemane, Father, if there's any other way, take this cup from me. And he's sweating drops of blood. He says, but not my will. Your will be done. And he hung on a tree, on a cross, and he bled and died because he had the capability to fulfill the law and to give us righteousness that would actually make us pleasing to God. And before he died, he cried out, it is finished. For those who are in Christ and trust in his death and resurrection, the righteousness that Jesus talks about here, he fulfilled and he gives to his people. Amen. But there is another righteousness. It's what we do with the righteousness that we've been given. That there's this sense in which to those who have been given much, the Bible begins to change our emotions and our feelings and causes us to go, yes, God, I long to make my life an offering unto you. I want God to walk with you and know you and treasure you. How does God do that? He does that when we go to this word and we approach it and we say, God, there's treasure in here. I have no idea where to dig. Would you dig in my heart and help put the treasure of your word in it. It happens through prayer when we know that we're meeting with the one who makes all things right. And if we don't need that after this week, when we see the, the heartache of what's happened in our country, but then, you know, this is a rough week for our country. You go on a world scale and stuff like this happens all the time. And Jesus is saying, I'm here. Because part of fulfilling the law is to make every wrong right again. One day he's coming again and every tear is going to be wiped away. Until that day, Jesus in the coming weeks of the Sermon on the Mount is going to show us what it means to have a transformed heart and mind. And he does anything but relax the law. Okay, so next week... He's going to say, you've heard it said, do not murder. I tell you, if you have hate in your heart towards someone else, you are guilty of murdering them in your heart. So we have this thing called road rage. None of you ever wrestle with it. But if you have ever experienced road rage, you have murdered someone on the road according to God's standard of holiness. We're also going to talk about, you've heard it said, do not commit adultery. But I say to you that if you look lustfully at another person, you've committed adultery with them in your heart. And it goes on and on and on for the whole rest of the sermon. Why is Jesus doing this to us? Why is Jesus making it so hard? So we'll be truly free. He doesn't want us to play a game. He wants his righteousness to reign in our hearts in our lives, and that is good news. We're gonna sing a song in just a moment. Um, I think it's called Love Constraining to Obedience. It's an old hymn written by a guy named William Cooper who battled depression most of his life. His mom died when he was six years old. He went to a boarding school where he was bullied. He fell in love with his cousin and couldn't marry her. 1731-ish, so a little bit of a different time frame. 
and then eventually, when he was 43 years old, ended up getting admitted into an insane asylum because he had basically gone crazy. But somebody ran into him, somebody by the name of John Newton, who we know as the author of Amazing Grace. And he went to move to the town where John Newton pastored, a town called Olney. And John Newton took William Cooper under his wing, this crazy person that had legitimately been in a crazy house because John Newton believed that grace can change things. William Cooper had some gifts for poetry and for hymn writing. And John Newton proposed to William Cooper, let's write a hymnal together. And they did. But it was a long journey, and guess what? Two more times in the midst of the writing of that hymnal, William Cooper had to go back to the crazy house. But the song that we're going to sing has these words in it. To see the law of Christ fulfilled, to hear his pardoning voice, changes a slave into a child and duty into choice. How can it be that one who wrestles with depression and mental illness could pen these words? Because the gift of Christ's imparted righteousness entered into him. And perfection was not attained by William Cooper, but it was attained by Jesus Christ. William Cooper, I think it's Cooper. Cooper's Savior and Lord. I'm sure you're a mixed bag today, okay? I'm sure there's all kinds of things going on in your heart and your life. Jesus says here, perfection's not up to you. I did it. And when you realize that I've done it, you'll take your eyes off you, you'll put your eyes on me, and you'll see I fulfilled the law. And you're not a slave anymore, you're a child. And what you used to thought was an unbearable duty, now it's your choice to obey. Let's pray. Father, as we continue to worship you and respond to your word today, I pray, Lord, that the words to this song we're about to sing, you would impart your righteousness in our hearts so that we can say them with truth. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing. Fulfilled to hear his pardoning voice can change a slave into a child and duty into choice. To see the law by Christ fulfilled, to hear his pardoning voice can change a slave into a child and duty into choice. Strength of nature can suffice to serve the Lord aright. And what we have, we misapply for want of clearer light. How long, how long beneath the law I lay? How long, how long? I struggle to obey Then to abstain from outward sin Was more than I could do Now if I feel its power within I feel I hate it too Then all my servile works were done us to raise now freely chosen in the sun I freely choose his ways now freely chosen in the sun I freely choose his way how long how long beneath the law I lay how long I 
struggle to obey how long how long in bondage and distress how long how long i tried without success i tried without success how long 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 to see the law by christ fulfilled to hear his pardoning voice can change a slave into a child in duty into joys. Amen. saying how long we don't know how long but we do know he is coming one day when heaven was filled with his praises one day when sin was as black as could be Jesus came Born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. The word became flesh and the light shined among us, his glory revealed. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried
man. The next song uh, we're going to sing this morning is uh, More Than Conquerors, and uh, it's in Romans 8, verses uh, 38 and 39. It says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation that will be able to separate us from the love that is our God, that is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So this morning, let's just celebrate that. And that is, he said everything, no exceptions, that anything we have done or will do will separate us from the amazing love that Christ has given us. Defiant in your name, 
the power in our veins, our Lord, our God, our conqueror. Our Lord, our God, our conqueror. Our Lord, our God, our conqueror. Amen. Amen. Praise God that we are more than conquerors through Christ. And uh, as we leave this place today, this isn't the benediction, but this is <laughs> the pre-benediction. Uh, as conquerors, uh, we don't go out and say, I'm the winner. We do say that in our hearts, but there, there's brokenness out there, guys. And we're the light and we're the salt. And, and we have to be the hands and feet of Jesus right here where we are. And uh, one very simple way we can do that is on your way out, uh, the Restore Network, which is a foster uh, support system for our community. Uh, they have taken many uh, children and put them in Christian homes, not just some crazy home that is looking for a check. Uh, and they're, they're just getting around them supporting them with prayer and one of the things they're doing is having a uh, school supply drive so outside there you can pick up a, a ticket it's probably ten dollars worth of school supplies not cheap stuff you know we want to give these kids the best uh, so if you would uh, pick one of those up and in the next week when you come uh, just bring back a few things and throw them in the box and, and these kids these families are going to be blessed because uh, it's not an easy thing you know so, and, uh, and now for the official benediction. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure it's official, <laughs> but um, one thing I want to share before uh, we leave today too, and many of you know this, but Robert and his wife Molly have answered a call to foster kids through Restore Network. And the Restore Network has come alongside Robert Molly in some really amazing ways. And, and after they answered the call to foster children, and many of you know this, and it's all right to share this, this is an amazing praise to God. Um, God has since blessed them. Uh, Molly is expecting a baby of their own as well. So... I feel like Abraham. <laughs> he, had a he had a little more gray in his hair than you do. You're, you're good. You're good. <laughs> there's, there's a beauty in knowing that Christ has fulfilled the law and then gives us his righteousness, which is empowerment then for us to walk in accordance with him who is the fulfiller of the law. And uh, I've not heard of a single story where, and even folks that are going through significant suffering and heartache and struggle, to walk with Christ through that, the ways that they testify of his faithfulness, of his provision, of his protection, and his power at work in them. Christ has given us the Sermon on the Mount and accompanied by his spirit and his word, it sets us free. Jesus said that, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So if you have other questions about any of that, there are cards in the pews, you can fill that out. If you just want somebody praying for you, you can drop it in the offering basket on your way out the door today. Or if there's someone on your heart, you just want us to join in prayer with, uh, we get righteousness of Christ through asking, and uh, we need to ask each other for help too. So anyway, let's receive this benediction. And now, God, to you, the one who sent Jesus to fulfill all righteousness so that the law will not break our backs but give us a guide. And by your spirit, Jesus, we ask that you would put your law in our hearts and enable and empower us to obey you, walk with you, so that the world may know that you send Jesus to be the Savior and Lord of all. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
May you go with God's grace and peace.